And, and there, there's, a, there's a, a challenge, if you may, in, in us saying, how do we as bosses in a pretty traditional service sort of create that capability as a natural sort of thing to say that we are going to indeed deliver core service and then we'll look at that situation and sort of ask ourselves, what are the opportunities here with the status and the situation and the time and the resources and all the other dynamics of it to say, how do we simply add value to that? We, we, we really have not studied that very much or even had much of a conversation about it. In fact, in a lot of systems, in the, in, this, in the system that I worked in, there were probably, well, not probably, there were rules against us adding value. In other words, when you got finished with your core service, you went in service and you went home. You didn't, you didn't stick around and do anything extra. We had get home itis, as somebody called it. And what we were concerned about, and not that it isn't a legitimate concern, is that we were, we were concerned about being ready for the next call. And we weren't very creative in saying that there's, there's a way that we could stay in service at that scene. We all had radios forever. In other words, that we could manage our status in a lot more creative, innovative way. They gave fire companies a lot more uh, leeway, if you may. And there was a lot more flexibility in the things that they could do for, fire, for customers. And in a lot of cases, most cases, they do it after the, the problem, the major incident problem or problems have been solved. So that's, that's another part of it that's kind of interesting. Let's see, how do we get bosses to, to first of all understand that and then to not only su support that in a, in a lot of different ways, in other words, to establish procedures, to train people, to give people the empowerment to do that, the opportunity to do it, and certainly the encouragement to do it when they have a chance. At the end of it, to ask yourself, how well did that system work in the sense of both the procedures and the people? And then sort of say, what kind of, how do we improve that system? In other words, how do we revise that and keep that current and keep creating action plans for improvement and so on? But if you look at organizations that have really first class customer service, there's just as much of a pre plan on the way they break out both core service and added value as we would have a pre-plan, let's say, on a target hazard. They would do a pre-plan on a particular customer situation, and then they would characterize in that situation, here's the opportunities we have to sort of connect to that customer in a way, again, that's both the basic service that we deliver and then extra that we can add to it. So they keep doing this over a period of time, and pretty soon the added value gets hooked back into the core service. So what you're doing is all the time you're raising the bar, but also what you're doing is you are challenging yourself to say, how can we continue to add value to the services and the relationship that we have with that customer? That's a huge, that's a huge challenge for us. See, we could ask ourselves, and this is kind of a fun little exercise, is if we were a, if, if, if we, think of, think of a fire department that was like a hotel, how many, how many stars would you want? How many stars do you want? Five. five. He says five. Yeah, good. What, why do you want five? It's the most. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. If, if, you have, if you've ever stayed in a five-star place? No, I can't afford it. Me either. I've, <laughs> I've burned a couple of them. <laughs> They're very nice. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. See, so if you take, and, and let me just use where I live because I'm kind of familiar with it, is there are, four or five five-star hotels within a 20-square-mile area. You know, it's a pretty small area, maybe five miles across it. I mean, they're, they're within three or four miles of each other. So you're the manager of one of those five-star hotels. What are you doing all the time? Taking care of my customers, okay. solving problems, whatever, okay. making them happy. Whatever they want, they're going to get. These, these four guys, the two guys on either side of you, each have their own five-star hotel. What are you doing with them? Watching what they're doing to see how, see how I can better myself and What my are company. they doing with you? Hopefully the same thing if they're trying to. Well, no, you, not hopefully. You hope they never come into your hotel. Yeah. <laughs> you hope they drown in the swim. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. 
So what you're doing in that industry, that industry is always looking at itself to do what? Better itself. To better itself, absolutely, because what do you want? You want to be the best. Because you, you want that customer, right. don't you? Yeah. We increase the support that we extend to firefighters because it's just a tough time. And, and, and we're delivering service to people who increasingly are having more difficult lives in the way we've mentioned here this afternoon of losing their jobs, losing their homes, wondering if they can feed their kids, the crisis in health care. I mean, it's, a, it just, it's a really difficult time. I don't mean to be gloomy about it, but I mean, hell, pick up the newspaper and read it. Well, the fire service fits into that just like any other public service would. So I think that fr from our standpoint right now, let me repeat myself, I think you got to kind of do two things at once. You got to somehow deal with those reductions, but you got to make up for it in somehow encouragement, support, planning, participation, communications, listening more and stay closer. Bosses are going to have to stay closer to workers during this because it's just a really difficult time. Uh, and, and it's a time when, when you're going to, there could almost be a natural inclination to say, why, why should we go out of our way to deliver customer service? Because it's a time when we're, we're actually getting cut, if you may. In other words, our resources are, are being cut. So there is another challenge for bosses. I mean, this is a tough time to be a boss, really. And how do you deal with situations in a, in a, a kind of a national situation where the, the workers are concerned, they're, they're scared, if you may? I think all of us are scared. Where's all this going in the process? They say numbers now. They say billions and trillions, like we used to say thousands and millions. I don't even, I can't imagine what the hell's a trillion and so on. I mean, you know, and there's nutty stuff, all this stuff with executives and, you know, it's a crazy time, I guess. So I don't know, maybe that's kind of a nutty answer, but I think it's, I think, I think it's, we're, we're, in for a, we're in for a period where we're, we're going to have to help each other kind of understand what's going on and get through it, I guess, is the point. And do that for the people that we're delivering service to. I mean, I can, I, in Phoenix now, there are more and more homeless people, people that have lost their house and their job, and they're simply sitting on a curb in downtown Phoenix. Well, their first line of public service defense is, is Engine 3. So how do we somehow keep Engine 3 hooked up to this to where they understand it and they're sympathetic and they're hooked, you know, and they're, and, they're, and they're effective in dealing with it. And they do. Engine 3 just happens to be a company that delivers a lot of service to the homeless and hell, they're all a bunch of sociologists. I mean, it's a terrific group, but it's a tough time. Yeah, hop in. I'd... This uh, this be probably a, about as crucial a time for not only selling it to the public, our taxpayers and so forth, but selling it to the firefighters on the line. Yeah. Um, we've got to show justification for being here and uh, we're all vying for a limited amount of dollars nowadays, so this is about a, a crucial moment uh, to step forward and, and make ourselves known to the public. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and if we think that, it, that the E stood for everything before, imagine what that E is gonna stand for here in the next, right now, and, and then for the next period of time. Because again, and, and, I, and I, I, don't, I don't mean to overstate it, because I think it's, it's just a fact, is it? You, you got, and, and of course, <laughs> In, in Phoenix, the weather is, is, is a lot more accommodating, but you, you got people living in cardboard boxes. I mean, so when you're, when, you're, when you're delivering service in the street, you better understand that, and you, you better be hooked up to that in a way that, that you're, a, you're a social worker. And I, and I think firefighters do that very naturally, and I, and I commend them. I commend everybody who's hooked up to this program. I mean, I don't say that as a challenge that the firefighters aren't going to be able to do that. I think the firefighters are going to have to keep doing that, I guess is the point, you know. But uh, interesting, crazy time right now, I guess. I'm One big question that you brought up when you started speaking about challenging times, what kind, of, what kind of future do you see for the volunteer fire service, especially with so many people who have so many other things to do and with declining numbers for volunteers and what do you see as the biggest asset in customer service for a volunteer organization that is, if nothing else, looking to get as many people as they can? I'm a, I work in a career fire department that I used, to, I used to tell people that I came from one of the largest volunteer fire departments in the country, had 2,400 members, 
if people would say, well, you, they paid you guys. I said, no, they paid us. It's just the only thing the firefighters ever did, really, was what they volunteered to do. And in a way, I think that's true, is that, is that we, we, most of the time, people do things because they do what they want to do. I think, and I've spent, in my, in, in my second life of being able to thankfully travel around the country and hang out with a fire service, I mostly have hung out with a volunteer fire service, and I, I am a huge uh, admirer of, of the volunteer fire service. I, I, think, I think there's challenges, obviously, in retention, recruiting, financing, just all over wherever you go, but I think the volunteer fire service is a treasure in this country, and I mean that sincerely. I think the future for the volunteer service is exactly like the career service or the combination service. It is directly connected to leadership. As I go places where there are fire, volunteer fire departments, they're 100% volunteer, and they, they are doing programs that are, are absolutely 20 years ahead of today. I go other places that you see just the opposite. So you ask yourself, what's the difference here? Any town looks just like any town. Well, when you get into it and you listen and you kind of hang out and you get to know people, what it ends up being is it's, it's, it, it has to do simply with functional boss behaviors. One system has a set of bosses that are engaged in functional, supportive, sensible, positive, customer-centered, non-selfish kinds of programs. You go to another place and they're involved in pissing contests, they're, they're competing with each other, they play favorites, they do all the junk that just completely messes up an organization. And you say, you know, this isn't really, re it ain't rocket science, it, it, the b just said, it ain't rocket surgery, is it has to do with leadership. Is the places that have leadership are prospering and the places that don't are trying to figure out what's going on. I think that there's no place where that's any more uh, true or, or present or acute than in, in a place where you're depending on volunteers. In other words, people are volunteering their time and their energy and their dedication. Many of you are volunteers, so I'm singing to the glee club here. So it isn't as if you can say, I'm going to cut your pay. <laughs> because people aren't getting paid in the norm, normal physical ways that most jobs do that. They, it's a labor of love, if you may. See, and how do we manage people who are engaged in a labor of love? People, people in that mode are very, very vulnerable. Just think about it. This goes back to that emotional literacy kind of thing. Is it, that it, uh, many, let me say this in here, because many volunteer fire departments that are doing the best are managed by women. Why? They are more emotionally literate. And let me be stereotypical. In other words, they're, they're a little more or a lot more inclined to look at the humanistic side, to look at the soft side, if you may, to look at the side that has to do with the way people care and the way they feel, the memory that that creates, and so on. And I, I've seen that in my own fire department because I was there before there was any women, and I was there after we recruited I don't know what it ended up being, eight or nine or 10 percent women. And you could see, particularly for, and I saw it during my career, I'll bet I saw 20 or 25 women who became officers, and you saw what they brought to that. My daughter is a battalion chief, so I mean, I'll brag about her. Very, uh, very capable gal, just like the rest of them. But it was interesting to see the, the effect of somebody who, who could connect to the humans. It's all about humans. It's all about relationships, isn't it? But, but even more so in a, in, a, in, a, in a volunteer fire department, the problem we had in a career fire department is people quit and stay. They quit, but they don't leave. So now they show up, but they really don't show up because they're somewhere else. Somebody hurt their feelings, somebody pissed them off, something happened to them, they had some kind of setback. So what they did is they just quit. But based on the benefits, they don't leave. Sounds kind of nutty when you say it that way. 
Well, in most volunteer, help me with this, but most volunteer organizations, when you quit, you what? You leave. Yeah, you, you don't. You don't. <laughs> so in a way, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little more or a lot more healthy than a lot of the career service, let me say that. Not to, I'm not criticizing my own service. But no, I, I, I think that, that there are, financially, there are some communities, if you look at the financial status of a volunteer fire department, it, it, it fits the profile of that community. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of places that historically and traditionally have been protected by volunteer fire departments and the communities have an enormous attraction to that historic form of deliverance service. There's places in America that I wouldn't get up and say, you ought to create a career fire department because they'll, they'll tar and feather you. I mean, the volunteer fire service is an institution in those places, legitimately too. I mean, I, I mean that as the biggest compliment you could pay them. No, I, I, don't, I, don't, I hear people saying that the volunteer fire service is going away or whatever. I think that's baloney. I, I think, I, I think there's, there's places, some of the best examples of progressive, effective, safe, well-managed fire departments in this country are volunteer. So, I mean, you, you see that, too. I mean, they're the, they're, they would be among the models of all the full range of career combo and volunteer departments. I think that this, one of the in, incredible strengths of a volunteer fire department are the vocations of the members. In other words, that every member has a, 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 a job, let me say, or a business or some other way. Well, when you sit, you, you, you're getting together, you know, butchers, bakers, candlestick makers, and so on, that bring an incredible set of skill to that organization. You see some places where they really exploit that, and I mean that in a positive way. In other words, that they use those, those experiences and skills and and again, vocations that people have. I don't think the career service does that as, well, we don't. We started doing a skills inventory of, of recruits. You take a recruit class in a, in, a, in a career fire, well, anywhere, but in a career fire department, you look at what those people have done. I mean, there is an amazing range of capabilities in that, I mean, in the training thing. And again, I don't think that we've been very good about not using that in the beginning and then somehow accessing experience at the end. It's another huge problem for us. The, 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 for right now, there's a lot of personnel systems that are encouraging people to retire, drop plans and incentives and, and packages and so on. So you're seeing more and more. I, I see in my travels more younger officers and fewer experienced officers generally. And, and I, I think in the Phoenix Fire Department now, the, the average age of the Phoenix Fire Department is like seven or eight years. That's for over 2,000 people. So we're promoting people who, who comparatively have a lot less experience than, than we were maybe used to a few years ago, who do a terrific job. And if you, you let them hang around and they'll get the experience. But I think there's another part of it that we need to look at as a service, almost as an internal customer service kind of a thing that becomes a huge part of that. Um, and I think, you know, we haven't talked about it here, and we need to before we get away, is to, to look at and think about the, the internal part of customer service. And it's probably the, the most challenging part when you, when you sort of look at it. And I've shared with other groups that Getting Firefighter Smith to be nice to Mrs. Smith was not a big struggle. I think I, we talked about that earlier. That the, the socialization that our firefighters have received from their parents and their families packaged them up pretty well to come in and take care of Mrs. Smith. And I think as a boss in the fire service, what I started to say more and more to the younger people is, is just is just as basic as saying, just do what your mother would tell you to do. If you wonder what to do, call your mom. Do that. I'll settle for whatever your mother tells you to do. Well, that, when, you, when you look at that as it, it an incredible uh, capacity or capability for a workforce to say these people are preconditioned, 
they're pre-packaged when they, before they come to us to do a set of really admirable, almost instinctively do admirable kinds of things and to instinctively avoid doing things that would get the mom look, which is, which is pretty powerful if you sort of look at it. So, so it, it really, f from the standpoint of, of, of us, what we're talking about here, going out and taking care of Mrs. Smith, young firefighter Smith has got really a pretty terrific set of instincts, doesn't have a lot of experience in the service delivery part, but you don't have to, you don't have to do very much for him or her to say this is the way that we're going to treat her. Now it might be, I mean, I mean interpersonally treat her, not professionally treat her. But he's pretty well trained in how to treat her professionally even, if you look at it. I, I looked at that a long time. But see, the, the challenge there is not him, not that youngster. The challenge is right here, is the boss. To say, how do we, how do we help that boss understand that the way that he treats that firefighter is going to get acted out when the firefighter delivers service to the customer. So we, what we set up there really is a, is, a, is a food chain. In other words, that what comes from the boss to the firefighter gets acted out between the firefighter and the customer on the receiving end of it. Well, if bosses, and it's interesting when you get to do this, if you ask bosses, how do you want that firefighter to treat that customer, most of them will give you a pretty good routine. They'll say, I want them to get there quick. I want them to solve their problem. I want them to be nice to them in order to add value to that. I want them to perform standard service. I don't want the firefighter to get hurt. In other words, I want to do, do a set of things that are explainable in the community. In other words, all those kind of service delivery things that we would say. Well, we ought to compel that boss to say, okay, boss, how are you going to manage that firefighter so that that firefighter consistently achieves those objectives that you just described? Because historically, we have not managed the American Fire Service in a way that supported the kind of customer service that we're talking about here. I won't say that we, did, that we discouraged it, but we didn't in encourage it. I worked in a system for 30 years, 35 years, before we started talking about customer service. And the way that we dealt with that is that we regarded the customer, what we call a customer today, in a former time was a victim. They were fire victims. I probably wrote that 2,000 times. We weren't being mean. We didn't mean it in a, in a negative way. It wasn't pejorative. In other words, we weren't being critical of them. It's just that we, we, nobody had ever sort of got our mind around saying, shift from a victim who's lost control, who doesn't have any options, who is on the, on the, the negative end of, of whatever is going on in the process, or is helpless, and so on, to being a customer who is a legitimate participation, participant in, in their service delivery situation. Once we said it, it was probably, and I said this earlier, the easiest change that we've made. In other words, to say, uh, to tell him to be nice to Mrs. Smith, what he said is, okay, let's eat. I mean, he didn't argue with us. He didn't say, no, I, I want to club her like a baby seal. I mean, that's silly to say. I mean, but so, so really, th that was the simple, I don't want to say simple part. What he does is not simple. I think the relationship is pretty basic, and that's why it works so well. But the challenge, again, is how do we get organizational behavior day to day, day to day, regular, day in, day out, behavior in that organization, environment, relationship, process, in other words, connections, the whole thing. How do we get that to support that kind of service delivery that we're talking about here? See, how does the Ritz-Carlton get that, that gardener to shut that mower off and go do the routine, go back to mowing the lawn? Well, the Ritz-Carlton, what they do, <laughs> is once every two weeks they have a customer service meeting. He said that gardener got $500 for shutting off the lawnmower in a meeting, public. 
And now, Ritz Carlton can, can give away $500. The Anytown, the Phoenix Fire Department can't give away $500. So we've got to give away something else that reinforces that, which we can. But he said, we train, we train everybody that comes into this organization, this hotel, not only what their function is, but we have about two weeks of just customer service. He says, we have a customer service meeting every two weeks where we will go over all the, 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 the compliments, the complaints, the whole process. He says, we'll probably give away two or $3,000 in that meeting, which he can do. He has a budget for that. So again, they have a plan. They say, we have a plan that we know works to create a system where, as they call it, and I love this, they call it ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. Well, we have uncircumcised savages cutting holes in roofs <laughs> so engine jockeys can drown, <laughs> you know, submerge the fire. <laughs> I don't know that we're ladies and gentlemen serving, whatever. But that's their kind of their motto, their little mantra, if you may. Well, for us, uh, how do we somehow do that? How do we create a, a, a system, a connection, a set of relationships inside this, the department that fosters what we're talking about here in five, let me call it five-star service on the outside? Well, you could almost say that in that, if you don't have five-star service on the inside, you're not going to have five-star service on the outside. You, you, can, you can talk about customer service all day long, but if there isn't some connection and con congruence, in other words, there's not some logic between the, the support that workers are getting and the, that's completely out of balance with the service that the organization expects them to deliver to customers. Again, it, you, you, you could do that for a while, but it, after a while, that you, you, just, you just run out of that in the sense that it's not logical and it's too painful and so on. Chief? Yes, sir. Kind of the word that pops in my head quite often as you're speaking this is the term empowerment. Um, you end up with a reward system, whether it be financial at the Ritz-Carlton or with us, kind of an emotional satisfaction of doing a job well done, but we're empowered to act upon the needs of the customer. Yeah, well, well, you know, and em empowerment is a, is a huge part of what we're talking about here. And, and let, let, me, let me ask you all, what, what are we empowered to do? Let me say, as firefighters, what are firefighters empowered to do? To protect lives and property. You don't need to be. It's in your job description. It's in standing orders, it's in SOPs, it's in guidelines, it's in directives. Does that, is there a fire department in here that needs to get permission to lay a line, to lay a hose line? Do you have an aerial device? Yeah. Do you need permission to put up your aerial? No. Do you need permission to cut a hole in a roof? No. If they ask for ventilation, sure. yeah. then... Yeah. Good, integrated part of coordinated fire attack. Yeah. What are you empowered to do? Management should empower you to do what's ever best for the, the fire district or the fire department. But management has to be able, you're allowed to be empowered as much as management will allow, basically. Okay. You say that. that, that I think you're restricted by your management. If you're afraid to act because there will be, you know, you'll get in trouble for doing something, even though you know it's the right thing to do, but mm -hmm. you can't because your boss is too strict to let you do something. So I think you're only empowered to do as much as you, you are allowed to do and as much as you're willing to do. Okay, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think you said that perfect, too. Engine 17 and ambulance 17 go on an EMS call like they do 15 times a day. They go to a, an older woman who's having some medical problem, whatever it is. They stabilize her, they package her, they put her in ambulance 17. The two young firefighters, BLS is it's still, a, it's a BLS, they're an ALS engine, but it's a BLS call. So they transport Mrs. Smith the Good Samaritan Hospital. 
They get her out of the ambulance. They get her in the ED. They're doing the hugging and kissing goodbye routine. And she's upset. So one of the firefighters said, what's cooking, Miss Smith? What's the matter? She said, I forgot my pink fuzzy security slippers at home. What do they do? I'm guessing they went back and got them for her. Went back and got them, yeah, yeah. W why? Customer service. Yeah, that's customer service, uh, uh, added value, uh, training, war stories, so on. The only reason I know about it is because her daughter wrote a letter and said that she wanted to thank us for the service that we delivered to her mother blah, 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 and P.S. Our family could not imagine those two young firefighters on the ambulance who went back and got her slippers. So we looked at that and said, you know, what's going on? We went and talked to the firefighters. What did the firefighters say? In the beginning, at first, what, did they, what was their reaction? Oh, oh no, I'm in trouble now. No, no, no I, I think we got past that. Yeah, that's a good comment, too. They couldn't even remember it. It, it. it wasn't that big a deal to them that they had it in their memory units until they really kind of thought about it. And we were maybe a month behind. It took that long to kind of get it through the food chain. And then when they remembered it, what did they say? No big deal. Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. Billy, you remember slippers? You know, it was one of those deals. What? Yeah. Oh yeah, remember she was on Elm Street. We picked her up, and she was upset. And we went back. You know, you know guys. Hey, wasn't a big deal. Yeah. Were they empowered? Go get the slippers. Now, when they got in that ambulance, they pushed a status button on their MCT that said "Available on Incident." In other words, if they left that incident open, they were still available on it, but if there was an ALS call or a fire, they would have dispatched them on it. In other words, I think all of us, and maybe some of you have thought this, wherever you are, you shouldn't let somebody die while you're going to get somebody's slippers. I mean, and, and I think that, I hope that we're smart enough to figure out how to do that. But in this case, we sent that, that, that incident, we sent an ALS engine with two EMTs, two two paramedics, state licensed paramedics, just like you all. Had an engineer, a captain of two firefighters, had an ambulance, had two EMT blue shirt firefighters driving the thing. Sent the whole medical system, we dispatched them with computers. They have onboard computers, they have every piece of medical equipment anybody ever invented. What does the family remember? The slippers. Yeah, the slippers. Now my question, or comment, or whatever you want to call it, when I hear one of these stories, is I say, particularly where it has to do with added value, is, is I will ask, what did it cost? Now what did it cost to, to go get her slippers? Gallon of diesel fuel. Hell, they waste a gallon of diesel fuel going to, to Starbucks, because I see them there, <laughs> along with the other six ambulances that are staged. Yeah. Hi, hi. <laughs> There's a sighting of the dwarf, they would say. Yeah. They're all available. They can re respond and do what they're supposed to do. But see, I guess a, a question is, is how do you get those two young firefighters just simply to go do that? Well. In the empowerment thing, we, we, we ask a set of, a set of questions. Is it, is it within our mission? Is it safe? Is it on your level? Is, are you accountable for it? Is it something you'll take, take accountability for doing? Will it stand the light of day? And so on. And then we say, if I answered all these are yes, don't ask for permission, just do it. Just go do it. Don't ask anybody. Well, here, I'm sure if you, not that we, interrogated them in any way, but if you ask the firefighters to process that in this little slipper caper, 
they would have said, yes, 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 so we did it. It was just that simple. Now, if we can get authentic, sensible, well-managed empowerment in the organization, what we do, in effect, is that we put the need, the customer, and the worker together. In other words, the, the, the workers are there, the firefighters are there, and they, they can see the need that that customer has right there, and they have the ability to use organizational resources to solve that customer's problem. There's no middle person in it, there's no big communications in it. It is a very robust relationship to freeing up those firefighters who are operating more probably on mission statements and values and that sort of thing than SOPs because it, it, my, my answer kind of hysterically and historically to the question is what are you empowered to do is to add value. You don't need to be empowered to do core service. You do that within the framework of the regular organization. A regular, not to discount how, how much it requires creativity and imagination and effort and so on, but most core service is driven inside the system by, by mechanisms that are in place every day, all the time, that support that service. Where we let that, that employee, that member, that firefighter, go out of that framework is to add value Whatever it is, use organizational resources to do something special for that customer that they can explain and that's in that empowerment routine. And when they get finished, they go back down and they get into the regular mainstream of what we do. But it seems to me that that's really mostly what employees are in an organization where, where empowerment gets kicked in to create that capability, let me repeat myself, of putting all that together in a way that that gets done almost seamlessly right where that customer and that need come together. Enormously powerful if we can get that really p packaged up and get that working the way it's, the way it's kind of designed to do. Most firefighters, in my experience, fit into that very, very well. Now what firefighters will do in the beginning of that is they're gonna find out whether it's beef or bologna. Hey, I'm empowered, let me go do some empowered thing. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna watch my boss. Now if somebody comes out and says, thank you very much for, for going and getting Mrs. Smith's slippers, and they write a, a, a report of exceptional performance, and they kiss them both right on the mouth, I'm just kidding, what's the message? What's the message? That they've done well. They do, you do, you're done well, absolutely. You're done splendid, as Casey Stingle said. What does that make you want to do next time? Do more, repeat the experience. <laughs> absolutely, do more. It's a great way to say it. Now, if I come out and say, what the hell were you thinking about, son? You did what? What are you thinking? Not to do that ever again. Yeah, no, this, is, this is baloney. This empowerment stuff ain't worth the paper it's written on. So all you gotta do, I, I mean, it's pretty simple, is, is it's easy to say that everybody's empowered. Hallelujah, have a big pep rally and make up some bumper stickers. Go out and do an empowered kind of thing. Now clearly, I think if you're in an organization that has been, let's say, more closely controlled, I think you ease your way in to, to what we're talking about here. I don't think that you just throw it up in the air and run under it, because people don't have a set of skills that caused them to be confident in doing that. And I don't mean that anywhere, I don't mean that critically at all for the people who were kind of involved in that. But, but uh, firefighters, I think, and a fire department is, is really well suited and well situated to, to be empowered, to use empowerment. It's a really effective, powerful way to use that capability. Uh, now there's some places, and we need to understand this, that you're not empowered. If there's a hazard zone, we're going to overmanage you. We're going to micromanage you. We are going to be very, very careful because of your welfare. And people, I think most firefighters understand that. But if we managed a normal situation the way we manage the fire ground, somebody would say you're nuts. I mean, so we're able to sort that out in the process. But the whole notion of empowerment, I think, is a, is a, is a very practical uh, 
it describes a very practical relationship between bosses and workers. It's, an, it's a, a really, it's a compliment to both of them when you watch it when it works. It's a, comp, it's a compliment to the workers because they have the capability to, to pull it off. In other words, and not, nobody does that better than firefighters. It's a compliment to the bosses because it shows that they have the confidence to be able to, to manage that. In other words, to say, uh, I don't have to control you all the time in, a, in some dogmatic kind of way, is that you, you will operate and do operate within the framework of self-control, which is the best and really the only authentic control there is when you really look at it. So empowerment is a, it can be a big deal. Chief, sure, question. Um, the question is, uh, how would you deal how would you deal with an older volunteer or older firefighter slash employee uh, to get them to accept the challenge, the assignment, um, and complete the assignment from a younger officer? The you know, younger officer giving the older uh, firefighter with less rank, how would you see us handling that? Well, I, th I think that where, where you have an age difference in the way you described it, in other words, you have an older worker and a younger officer, that the, the younger, and this, this isn't terribly profound, but I think the younger officer needs to really be careful of, of uh, not disrespecting the older worker. In other words, that respect becomes, I think, a big, a big part of that. And, and when we look at respect, mostly, for us, what that means is don't look down on somebody. So there, I think the beginning of it is to say to that older worker, and I can remember, not so much in, later in my life, but when I was going through the system in the beginning, I mostly had workers that were older than I was. I was a young boy wonder in the system. So I, ha I had all these old, old geezers that worked for me who were just absolutely terrific. Well, and I, I found that if I listen to them, if I access them by asking them, uh, most of the time they were really pretty helpful. I think, though, that there were situations where I sent them a message that they knew what I stood for, but most of all they knew what I wouldn't stand for. And occasionally somebody will test you a little bit, but I never really had much of a problem even with that. But I think, I think if, if you're respectful, if you use that person's experience and capability, if you provide support to them, if you show them that, that, that you admire th their experience, that you're not arrogant because you're an officer, not that you won't exert the, the, the influence that you need to to be effective as an officer, uh, I think uh, part of it is, and it's a huge recurring word and theme and idea and concept that's kind of the centerpiece of what we're talking about here this afternoon is simply be nice. In other words, treat, treat people wherever you can with respect and kindness and consideration and, and, and patience and so on. Uh, I think for older, for older people, for older workers in the system, they probably do things their way. You need to be pretty patient with that. In other words, older people, we, we, we get set in our ways. Uh, for, for us as bosses, in a general sense, I don't think that we ought to be as hung up in how we do things. In other words, I see bosses, and, and, I, and I did it myself, so I mean, I'm talking about myself, got in trouble because I thought everybody ought to do things the way I did it. Well, it, pretty soon you discover, you know, there's almost as many ways of doing this, given that you do it safely and you do it within the context of the regulations of the system, but that there's as many ways of doing some things as there are people doing them. Uh, dealing with kids the other way, where, you, where you're, you're going the other way. In other words, that, that you're dealing with people that don't have very much experience. I see that too, is, is that a lot of times these kids, while I'm trying to figure out what's going on, they Google it, and they figure it out and write up a report and it's all finished, and I'm still trying to figure out what, what day it is. So there, what I've started to do is just say, go Google it. Google on, or whatever. But, it, but again, a lot of it, and again, I'll go to, 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 to today, is that they have enormous information management skills. They don't have very much tactical wisdom because they don't have the experience. 
In other words, he, he, he has access to a lot of information and can de- he's skillful in dealing with it. He just hasn't seen a lot of buildings fall down that have been burning, have, do you? Yeah, he'll learn it, he'll learn it. But if you can put him with somebody who is more experienced, then the water kind of flows the other way to say, okay, you need to help him understand that. But I don't know, it's a kind of a generational thing. There's a, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on now between generations. And they say that there's now, there's in some cases, there's four generations in the workforce. So there it requires some, some understanding and skill and emotional literacy to somehow, do you, how do you put these generations that each have their own really special set of skills and strengths together to sort of make it synergistic so we just use what people are good at, you know? I mean, you know, it looks like you have something else there. <laughs> yeah, well, I had another question. Uh, what do you see as some, what are some of your predictions for major changes in the future of the fire service? One of them, and forgive me for being a broken record, and that's a very old-fashioned way to say it, to being, uh, to re- being repetitive, is we, there, are, there are some places that are going to redefine the fire service in this economy. And that's going to happen, and we're not going to like it. In other words, what it's going to be is that we're going to have to operate with less than we ever even imagined. Those, those, those reductions in our capability have, the, they contain the opportunity for us to redefine ourselves and participate in that, or for us to be victimized by that. Uh, there's probably, well, not probably, there are opportunists out there that will take advantage of that, that re- reduction in resource to act out agendas that they have that they would have, they would have liked to have done to us a long time ago. And I don't mean to make that real sinister. So I think that's a huge part of the, what's going on now. I mean, you can't take, there, there are public systems now that are taking 20% reductions. Well, you gotta, you gotta say that's the most profound thing that's happened in 50 years when you sort of look at the impact of that. Now, I think for us, and this is sort of with your question, what effect does that have in the future? In other words, how do you leverage that to maybe understanding how that's gonna influence what we do in the future? I think, that, I think just what we talked about here before, I think that people are gonna, our customers are gonna depend on us more because of the situations they're going through. I, I don't think we've talked our, our way through that very well. We need to get a better plan. Just to say that, that, that and just what I said before, is, is that you, you're gonna have people on the street, living on the street, just because of the, the economy and all the stuff that goes with that, 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 that are, not, are not typically ho- homeless people, if you may. Some of them do not have very much skill to live on the street. So we're going to obviously pick up some of that slack. And again, I don't know exactly how that, I don't know in any way how all that's going to work out in the process. I think that, I think that the young people that are coming in the fire service, uh, to me, are absolutely terrific. I think for the older people, we're going to have to figure out a way to hook up their capabilities sooner and sooner. We need that capability. We need him to Google. <laughs> And, and access that information and then help us convert it into ways, in, in, into packages that we can really use. In other words, it's usable information. I think the, the other way, and I mentioned this before, is that there's a lot of experience that's leaving the fire service. That's experience that is, it, it's, it's retail experience. It's, it's, it's officers and others that learn one fire at a time, fire behavior and structural responses and burn combinations and water capabilities and how long somebody can live in a fire area unprotected and so on. How much they understand the risk, gain, safety system, hazard relationship. Huge capabilities that again, they gained at one, one incident at a time. I don't know how we can, can extract that experience and somehow make it usable to, to the young, to, all, to everyone, but particularly to younger people. Uh, we, we, we're positioned, we are still the most popular, uh, firefighters and paramedics, the most popular and respected and trusted occupations in the country. 
I think that'll be a big thing in the next five or six years, in other words, it always is, because it creates the relationship basis between us and the people we serve. I mean, at 2.30 in the morning, when he rings her doorbell, she's happy to see him, and she lets him in. If she won't let him in, if they won't let ladder seven in, he's sitting out at the curb. Well, at 2.30 in the morning, Mrs. Smith is pretty picky about who she lets in her house. Well, we have complete access to the community. We're the only agency in our form of government that doesn't need a search warrant to go anywhere. Uh, we, they can, we could get people arrested for interfering with us. I mean, now there's a position to be in. So I think there we're going to have to, we, 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 we need to leverage that position, that very positive position in the communities to try to help the communities. I mean, that's, again, in the times that are here now. I don't know. It's, it'll be interesting to see. The, in, the in, the, in, the, in the financial recovery thing, there's going to be a lot of uh, public works, it looks like. That might be something that the fire service is able to hook up to. I, I don't know that much about it, honestly. I'm not that informed on it. Or maybe nobody is. Maybe it's too new for anybody to know. But uh, it's, a, it's an interesting time right now, like it always is. But, I, you know, I, 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 I think... A, bright future for the fire service. I think it's a, we'll, we'll leverage the things we've done in the past for what we do in the future. So hang around, buy a ticket, <laughs> get on the truck. It, it'll be an interesting ride for us. If we all get there together and we help each other, it works good. Forgive me, this sounds like a pep talk, and I guess it is, is that when we get wrecked, we get wrecked from the inside. Nobody's going to come in and, and do it to us. We do it to ourselves. If we lose power, they didn't, take it, they didn't take it away from it, we gave it away, and so on. Uh, not that we want to be powerful particularly, but you want to have enough influence to be able to make an effect, and so on. Uh, I think this business we're talking about here has a huge future for us. Is, 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 can, we, can we create internal behaviors that support the external service? It's just that simple, too. Can we create a food chain between the bosses, the workers, and the customers that becomes more and more positive, where bosses begin to understand the situations that, that we find customers in based on input from those workers, from the firefighters. See, and that's, that's a, a, a challenge for us because most semi-military organized groups like us communicate mostly from the top down. In most fire systems, the top doesn't see a lot of customers. The bottom is who's the, who, who knows the most about the needs, the conditions, the status, the relationship, the dynamics of those customers. So for bosses, and I could see this at the end of my career, as I was struggling all the time in a positive kind of way, but, but I spent a lot of time in meetings and in different kinds of ways trying to connect to, to firefighters to, to, to tell me what's going on with the customers. Because I, I never saw a customer. See, and I could see as I went along is that they were, firefighters were very, very skillful in delivering service. And they are, and you are, and I, I mean that as a compliment. We have not taught firefighters how to be sort of community analysts. In other words, how do you somehow identify basic community elements, interests, and then the dynamics of those so that you can start to predict sort of wh where, where's our service delivery going with, with the needs of these people out here that we're serving? But see, it's, it, it, we're upside down because it's this the, 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 that I, 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 I communicate from the top on down through the organization to, down to the level that is actually dealing with customers. Sometimes it's almost impossible to get any input back up if you sort of look at the organizational dynamics. So we need to turn that upside down. And you look at places and organizations that lose track of that and they, they end up going away. Uh, we mentioned uh, Osmobile. There's nobody called the salesman. And they, and no, one, one, no one talked to the salesman. The guy in the white shoes with the white belt that's going out, walking out there selling you that car. And the, and the salesman would have told him, you can't sell these cars. This is why the guy's selling Hondas now. And Toyotas and so on in the process. So you lose track of that, boy, that's a tough separation. So this is another thing with the future. 
is how do we keep this connected so that we understand and we're, we're, we're a, the, the, the guy, the, the, the best hockey player in, in history said, they asked him, why are you such a good hockey player? He says, well, I figure out where the puck is going to be and I skate there. So he was always where the puck was. Well, that's what we kind of got to do. You got to skate to where that is. Well, how do you understand that, know that, and stay ahead of it and predict it and so on?